Hi, my name is Gershon Zinger, and this is going to be the first of a series of talks of lectures that I give mostly to residents, but hopefully they'll be informative. You can go to the website drzinger.com for, uh, for other links. Anyway, this talk is uh, a situation we see quite often. A patient comes in and their wrist is acutely inflamed, and the question is, is it infected or not? How do you treat it? How do you evaluate it? It comes up at least once a month in our hospital. So here's, I'm going to start with a case example. It's a 90 year old male. This is a real case who came in with acute left wrist pain. Uh, uh, there's not much in the history, no history of trauma. He has no history of gout. It started just the day before. His past history is uh, notable for atrial fibrillation. History. On exam, he is afebrile. His hand is swollen, tender, red, there's pain with movement. His labs show an elevated white count, CRP is elevated. So the question, how do you approach this? So his wrist was aspirated. The cell count was 134,000, very impressive. Crystal exam is pending, cultures are waiting. So what do you do? Is it infection? Is it gout? Is it something else? How do you approach this? So here's a study that was recently published in the Journal, Journal of Hansard European 2017, and it gave a great algorithm on how to approach this, and in particular gave risk factors. So this is what I want to go over. I don't agree with everything. It's a level four study overall very well. So they had 77 patients with wrist inflammation, uh, none of which had a history of trauma and none of which had an obvious diagnosis, such as uh, infected tenosynovitis, osteomyelitis, or, an, uh, or a known inflammatory condition, right? Just like the patient here. They presented with acute uh, inflammation of a joint. The question is, they looked at these patients, they knew what the final diagnosis was, and they wanted to see what were the factors that uh, were related to giving an ultimate diagnosis. Now, overall, only 20% had an infection. So if you were a betting person and you just said all of these are not septic, then you'd be right 80% of the time. But the problem is you can't really be wrong 20% of the time because the wrist with an infection ends up with uh, cartilage that's destroyed. So most of these that were not septic were either gout or pseudogout with very rare exceptions. So basically what we're talking about here is gout, pseudogout, or infection. When they compared these two groups of patients, they saw that there were factors that were very significant in guiding you towards one direction or the other, in particular, uric acid level. In the patients that were septic, none of them had an elevated uric acid level. In the non-septic patients, about a third had an elevated uric acid. So it means that it's not sensitive, but it seems to be specific. And uric acid level is certainly worth getting. Uh, when they looked at x-rays, only six had chondrocalcinosis, and I'll show you later an example of that. So most of them did not have any findings on x-rays. However, when they did show chondrocalcinosis, all of those patients were related to gout or pseudo. Now, these are factors that were not helpful, okay? Polyarthropathy. Somebody comes in with multiple joints that are inflamed, doesn't guide you because both septic and non-septic had a similar incidents. Diabetes was not helpful. Uh, elevated white count or elevated sed rate or elevated CRP. None of those were specific because even though they might seem to be markers of a septic or infected wrist, the majority of patients with non-septic wrists also had elevated markers. And here's what was helpful and there's four factors here. So and the first two are related. Gout by history, or a pre-existing gout ep gouty episode or elevated uric acid. And almost all of those patients with one or both were non-septic in origin. It doesn't completely rule out sepsis because you can have a history of gout in the past and then you present with an infection. But the majority of those people were not septic and chronic renal failure. When it comes to uh, elevated markers or markers of, inf of inflammation, one at a time wasn't helpful, as we saw in the previous chart, but two or more 
that was helpful. That tended you towards a septic diagnosis. 100% of patients who ended up being septic had at least two markers that were elevated. Although 50% of non-septic also had two or more. <coughs> so these are things that guide you toward, they're not definitive. Okay, but there's four factors here. Gout by history, elevated uric acid, and chronic renal failure, those tend you towards a diagnosis of non-septic. And two or three markers of infection tend you toward a diagnosis of infection. Now, in the patients that were septic, they had positive cultures from the wrist in more than 50%, but also from the blood. So it's important to consider that as well, that not just cultures from the wrist aspiration, but also from blood. When it comes to aspiration, they only aspirated six. So this is one of the things that I don't agree with that article. I think that patients that come in should get aspirated. Certainly, crystal exam is an important part of the evaluation. And also you need to see what's growing. Um, when you do the aspiration, uh, you need to use a large bore needle. So after local anesthesia, note the angle of the needle here. It's about 10 or 15 degrees uh, to the perpendicular in the direction of the joint. And uh, you should send it not only for culture, but obviously for also crystal. The workup therefore, with what we've seen that's important and relevant here is labs, white count, sed rate CRP, uric acid level, and renal function. Wrist x-ray should be done, and you should find out if there's a history of gout. Okay, so labs, wrist x-rays. Um, a couple of the things that might be helpful for diagnosis, there's a dual energy CT that's specific for, uh, for gouty deposits. It's very interesting. To and ultrasound has been used also for gout, and specifically there's this double contour uh, which you can see in the middle where there's uh, crystals that are deposited on the cartilage that's consistent with gout. And then pseudogout crystals are deposited within the cartilage and it's, you can see it like a line in between the two cartilaginous surfaces. So a well-trained ultrasonographer might also give an underlying diagnosis. So let's get back to the case and let's look for the clues that we just mentioned. So a nine years old doesn't help, a wrist that's red, hot and swollen, does not help. Cardiac history has no influence. He has no history of gout, which might tend you toward infection. A white count and a CRP that are both elevated might tend you toward infection. His creatinine and BUN are normal, so there's no renal dysfunction. And the aspirate of 134,000 may or may not tend you toward infection, but certainly it can be just that high in gout as well. So we still don't know, but here's a couple of extra clues. Number one on his x-rays, there was indeed chondrocalcinosis, which is the calcification of the TFCC. And it turns out that his wrist aspirate the next day was positive for pseudogout crystals. His cultures were ultimately negative, and this patient did not have an infection. He had acute inflammation. So in general, if it's not septic, then your treatment options are, and I have found over the years, indomethacin is so specifically good for gout or pseudogout, uh, 25 milligrams, three times a day for up to seven days. In younger patients, I'll give them double that dose for the first two days. You have to be careful if they have any history of GI bleeding or renal dysfunction. You can try other non-steroidals. They're not as effective as indocin for whatever reason. Colchicine is used for prophylaxis, but not during an acute attack. And if they can't get uh, anti-inflammatory medication, uh, either an allergy or a renal dysfunction. One option is steroids, but you have to make sure that they for sure don't have an infection. If it's septic, then the normal treatment is open surgery. Arthroscopic can also be done. And there is also a place for repeated aspiration. In particular, let's say you're not sure that they have an infection or uh, they have too many risks. To so could you have both? The answer is Rarely it's possible. In this article by Claiborne, they give a rate of 1.5% of both, uh, both gout or pseudogout and infection, but in general, it's one or the other. So what's the difference between gout and pseudogout? I use them all interchangeably. There are some differences. Number one, crystals uh, in gout, the crystals are uric acid crystals, which 
is the reason that there's treatment for it. And in pseudogout, they're CPPD or calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate. Uh, in gout, it's mostly male, although you can have female, and in pseudogout, it's equal. In gout, x-rays can show osteoarthritic pattern. In, in pseudogout, you can see the chondrocalcinosis, not all the time. There are medications in gout that can lower uric acid. There's no specific medications in pseudogout. And for the same reason, you can uh, have a diet to lower uric acid. And there's nothing specific that I know of for pseudogout. And the attack in both cases can be precipitated by local trauma. So the history of trauma you need to take with a grain of salt it may or may not be related to. So here's the workup. Labs, white count, sed rate, CRP, uric acid level, renal function, wrist x-rays, and find out if they have a history of a previous and the evaluation and treatment, and this is more my algorithm, first of all, if it's likely that it's not septic, then I don't treat both uh, inflammation and infection at the same time. I try to decide ahead of time what is by far the most likely. And if I think that it's non-septic, I treat them only for inflammation, and I discharge them on PO Indocin with a follow-up in two days. If I'm not sure, then it's totally reasonable to admit the patient, treat for both, while you're waiting for the call to results. And if it's likely infection, then you can either operate, or if you're again not sure, you can do repeated aspiration until you see whether they're responding to antibiotics or whether the call is positive. So thank you very much. I hope that this was uh, educational.